mysterywire.com home of the unusual and unknown from area 51 to the paranormal it's your source to the most vetted ufo stories and special investigations in the world take a journey into the universe of mysterywire.com all right bryce it's great to talk to you uh for those in our audience who might not know about you i mean you've been around the ufo alien topic for a long time uh as a producer and writer but uh, you, you, your career actually started uh, here on the good side, right? You were a journalist, hardworking journalist. I, I did. I guess I have gone to the dark side. I started out, uh, you know, I went to uh, journalism school and I, I got a, a degree in broadcast journalism, like, you know, and did what you're doing. I, uh, I was a local TV news reporter, went to work for CNN, uh, worked for PBS on air. But then at some point, my wife, I, I remember we were living here in Los Angeles and and I, the show that I was working on got canceled. So there was, you know, we were thinking, well, what do, what do anchormen do? They, they go off to another market. And that just sounded like kind of a drag. And she said, well, have you ever thought of writing a screenplay? And I never had. So I did. And they bought it. And so I kept doing it. So that's where I am today. You became a muckety-muck. I mean, in, didn't you? I don't know if I'm a well. That depends on your your definition <laughs> of muckety muck, uh, of course. But you know, I've enjoyed a, a good run in Hollywood, and 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 I've also had a a whole lot of interest in the UFO topic uh, that that's gone on for gosh decades now, and uh, and it originally started just trying to be someone who knew what he was writing about. I mean, if you do uh, if you write a screenplay about something on assignment. Uh, you do a deep dive into the material. You want to know what you're talking about. So the more I did my deep dive into UFOs, the more I realized that uh, there was, uh, you know, a lot of smoke there and probably a fire. And and then over the years, I've just kept at it. And I realize um, it's uh, it's something that I believe very deeply. And I had to write fiction in order to learn the facts, I guess. That's a, that's a fascinating journey. As a journalist, you never covered the UFO subject. Well, um, I, you know, I, people ask me that, and I try to think back, and I guess the best place I could answer might be the CNN experience. I never covered anything like that for CNN, even though in L.A. at the time I was here, there were UFO events, but we didn't, the assignment desk never sent us out on anything. And in fact, I'm pretty, pretty sure that if I had said, hey, uh, let's do a little investigation into UFOs, people would have said, you know what, we'll see you later. Go get another job. So I, you know, you just, it was sort of that self-enforcing uh, secrecy within the news media. And I think if there's anything that has truly and marvelously changed just in these last three years, it is that it's not completely ridiculous for mainstream journalists to talk about UFOs. Although, and I don't know that I would call him a mainstream journalist, but I saw the Lou Dobbs interview this morning with uh, Donald Trump. And Dobbs had a smirk on his face through the whole thing. He laughed at the end. He let Trump get away with no follow-up questions and, uh, and a pretty sad answer. And I just thought, you know, haven't we got beyond that by now? I mean, hasn't the memo got out to people like him that uh, this is a real issue and that we should treat it with seriousness? It's not just enough to ask a question if what you're going to do is smirk through the answer. We'll come back to that. Uh, sticking with your background for a moment, when I said muckety muck, you were head of the, the Emmys. You were the head of the uh, right. What was, I was the time? I was the. Uh, I I made the. I don't know if it was a mistake or a, a great move, but I decided to run for uh, chairman and CEO of the Television Academy. I got elected in two thousand one. Uh, about a week before 9-11, uh, or actually just a month before 9-11, took office right before 9-11. And then, of course, the Emmys were supposed to happen on September 16th of that year, and they didn't. We had to uh, postpone the Emmys twice. They'd never been postponed in history in 49 years at that point, and I did it twice. And I think there's a lot of uh, actual comparisons to what they've had to go through this year. Uh, I, I had to deal with, uh, do you really want to throw a party that nobody wants to go to, which was sort of the 9-11 response. Uh, most of the people that w were going to go to the Emmys didn't want to put on a, a tuxedo or an evening gown and go down a red carpet in that very tragic time. And right now, they really can't go to the Emmys. So I believe that the Emmys this year are all going to be um, uh, at well, they'll probably look like uh, the Jimmy Kimmel show looks right now because he's the host and the producer. 
I, I just was imagining you in that position. You get to hobnob with the the, the elite of Hollywood, big name actors and directors, and and uh, it gives you access to them to talk about this topic. And I'm sure you have over the years a lot of big names. It does. I've I've met thousands of people I wouldn't have met otherwise. Some uh, sometimes it's not so good. I have a picture of me from the 9/11 Emmys with Les Moonves on one side and Ellen DeGeneres on the other <laughs> that I'll probably never put out again for obvious reasons. But for example, <laughs> that one just hit me the other day and I went, "Wow, that would used to be a great photo and now it's just not a photo you can show." But uh, you, in answer to your question, that's absolutely true. For example, um, at the uh, 2002 Emmys, uh, I didn't realize this as chairman, but they asked me, well, where do you want to sit? I didn't realize I got to pick. I said, uh, well, uh, I, I really like Band of Brothers. What about sitting with Spielberg and Hanks? And they said, sure. So that year I sat with Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. We did not talk UFOs uh, at that time because in reality, I'd worked on uh, one of Spielberg's shows, Taken, and we had talked UFOs. Um, so, yeah, it was, uh, it was a great thing. It, uh, I, I can't say that um, it's the greatest career move because instead of writing and making a living, you spend your time uh, giving other people awards. But, but it was a great uh, three years, so it was fantastic. Um, as you mentioned, you wrote a book, a, a book an article about it on Medium, uh, yeah. about your Hollywood experience and how working on fictional series um, led you to a realization that this is real. Uh, is there a particular moment when you go, holy crap, this is true, it's real? I think that we all have that story. I call it your UFO moment of Zen. Uh, and it, it happens for everybody in a, in a, at a different time, but it's often the same thing. You have a little interest, you hear about it, you're skeptical, maybe some friends talk to you about it, you do a little research, you read a book, then you get a little more interested and then one day you start to have that epiphany. For me, um, I had written, uh, well, I mean the, the, the sort of longer version, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, like a lot of people, I fell in love with the topic uh, earlier in my life, but I, did, I kind of dropped it. Then in, I believe, 87, I read Communion and it kind of blew my mind. I was like, oh my Lord, what a great, I thought, I still to this day think Whitley Strieber is one of the greatest writers in the uh, the UFO movement, if, if such a thing can be said to exist. He's just a terrific writer, but I didn't know if it was true or not when I read it. I thought, you know, I've been reading this guy for years, and uh, now he's saying this is true, but it reads like any of his novels. So I continued to read on it, and I got this idea in my head, and, I, I, and, and he did inspire me. I thought it was a great what if. What if the government knew that the uh, uh, Whitley Strieber was being abducted, and what if the government knew he would be abducted again because it was a repeat kind of thing? And what if they wired up his house so that when it did happen again, they would know and they could try to shoot one of these things down? So I, I started researching more, and I wrote that movie. At first, it was called Progenitor. It went on to become a, a movie called Official Denial, which was the Sci-Fi Channel's uh, first original film. But to get back to the moment of Zen, so there I was, it was late at night, uh, I, it's, it, my house is dark, I've got just a little light over me, you can just imagine that. My wife is sleeping, the kids are sleeping, it's just me up at three in the morning, trying desperately to feed my head with a few more facts so that I could write a really terrific and, and a, a film that would feel authentic. And then it just hit me, I just realized this is real. You know, I, I, this isn't just a story that I'm researching anymore, I, and, and there are great stories to tell about it and a lot of made up ones, but I just at that point had that kind of th moment where it goes click and then you say, okay, well that kind of changes my entire worldview and what am I going to do with this? Now, I felt at that time I had two choices. Choice one was run, run like hell, get away from this thing. It's too crazy. You don't want to be a part of it or double down and make it a part of your life. And I, I chose the latter. And and I haven't looked back, and I felt good about it, and I feel even better about it today. You've been involved in so many productions, movies, series, but I want to focus on two in particular that really have made a, a lasting impression. Uh, the first is Dark Skies, yeah. uh, a series that should still be on the air today um, uh, because it was great. It was, it was terrific. Very X-File-ish. Tell me about how that series came to be and what happened to it. 
Well, interesting. Uh, just to clarify, some people are going, Dark Skies? Yeah, I saw that movie. That is not my movie. I wrote a TV series for NBC that I created with Brent Friedman back in the 90s. It was called Dark Skies. That's 20 some years before the Dark Skies film came out, which I had nothing to do with. Uh, the idea was that we wanted to take the two greatest conspiracy theories of American history, uh, Roswell and JFK, and put them in an atom collider and just smash them together and see what happened. So we wrote a, a pilot set in the 60s about a naive congressional aide that goes to Washington, D.C. because he's going to be part of the new frontier. And he ends up being recruited into Majestic 12 and gives a piece of the Roswell wreckage to JFK, who says he's going to tell the truth in his second term and ends up getting killed. So that's how the pilot started. So the, the series was an attempt to take the DNA of American history and the DNA of ufology and kind of weave them into this double helix of uh, storytelling. And I think we did a pretty good job of it. I think um, at the time we were out sort of at the time we were close to when X-Files was out. And a lot of people said, oh, that's an X-Files ripoff. But I've been working on this for years before X-Files even came out. But that's an argument that can't be won. But what we decided to do that was different is X-Files was all about the tease. And we said, we're not gonna be a tease. We're gonna actually say some things. So we showed him a UFO uh, on the opening scene. We brought the guy into Majestic 12. We didn't, we didn't tease. We were about uh, dealing with an alien problem. Uh, so the, the, the show that seems uh, kind of like it, uh, I, that I felt was uh, kind of uh, similar, was Project Blue Book, because they were trying to do period UFOs. And, you know, I don't want to get in an argument with Project Blue Book fans. There's two different approaches you can take to it. And what we tried to do with Dark Skies was that weave. And, and, to, and, and it was just different, but it, it felt a little the same. Plus, I frankly think the 60s were a lot more fun to write than the 50s. So I had a great time with it. It was just a, a terrific uh, thing. But I will say this. Um, the movie I wrote uh, several years earlier, Official Denial, did not get me much attention because it wasn't the world's greatest film production-wise. But once Dark Skies came out, things started happening and people came to us and we found ourselves in the middle of, of the UFO uh, situation, cover-up, whatever you want to call it. And so from that point on, I, my mind was electrified about what, what is really going on. And it sort of bled over into my own private life as well. I mean, you had people come to you and sort of like uh, threaten you, right? We did. I wouldn't, it wasn't a threat per se, but I will say that uh, we had a dark sky. Uh, you know, this is a larger uh, story. I'll give you the very brief version. Sure. I am trying to write more about it because I feel like I should, all of us should tell our stories at this point to sort of create that tapestry of contact and, and disclosure. So here's mine. Um, when Dark Skies was premiering on NBC, it was September 21st, uh, 1996, and we had a giant party in my backyard to sort of show the cast and crew the, you know, when it aired live. And so we were all set up and it was a lot of fun. And a guy came to that party who was not invited, suddenly was in my backyard, uh, and he said he was from the Office of Naval Intelligence and that they had seen our pilot, this is before it aired, and that they thought it was pretty good. And they wanted to help us because we'd gotten a few things wrong. Now, I was throwing a party, so I didn't have time to spend a lot of time with the guy. Uh, but my partner, Brent Friedman, invited this guy to come to the offices the next week. And he brought another guy with him. And, you know, these two guys said they were from O&I. And I will say they looked like SEALs. I mean, they were lean, tough. And instead of... Um, sort of being fanboys kind of currying favor with us, they were almost dismissive. The older guy that came to the second meeting acted very much like, I can't believe I have to deal with these nitwits, uh, you know, and, but I do. So he, they gave us what I would call a two hour briefing um, that they said is what was, was going on. And um, I listened. Uh, I, there was nothing much I could do about it. And then the, you, you, you might say, well, why didn't you follow up more? At the end of this thing, the, really, the thing that came down, and, and I think this is sort of emblematic of ufology, things happen that are so extremely strange that you say, why would that happen that way? And here's a good example. So these guys 
have crashed my party. Then they've come to the office and acted sort of like, uh, okay, you idiots, here's what you need to know to do your show right. And I had sort of thrown them out because I was busy producing the show and I didn't really have time and I didn't really know who they were. They followed up by saying, okay, if you still don't get it and you still don't believe uh, what we're trying to impart to you, we'll let you meet the big, the big guy, the boss. I forget what they called him. But the implication was he was a top Navy guy. And they said that we could come down and meet him in Long Beach. Uh, and here's where the specific gets so weird. The meeting they wanted to have in Long Beach was going to be at midnight in a cemetery. <laughs> okay. And uh, I said to my partner who was doing these sort of back and forth negotiations, I said, look, man, I've got a wife and three kids. There is no way I'm meeting these guys or anyone else at a cemetery at midnight. End of discussion. And so that's the last I ever really heard of these guys. The other uh, uh, project that I want to touch on is one you mentioned a couple of minutes ago is Taken. Mm. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, as everybody's shutting down uh, earlier this year, uh, there's discussion and chatter online about, hey, what movies should we watch? What books should we read? I put out a recommendation that people should look at Taken because I, I had the DVD. Uh, right. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's massive, a massive production. Spielberg involved in that project, and it's terrific. It weaves in so many angles of the UFO story, Area 51, um, all yeah. kinds of uh, personalities that uh, sort of uh, imply personalities. Talk about working on that, what your role was uh, working with Spielberg and his uh, interest in the subject. Well, the first thing I would say just out of uh, sheer uh, personal interest is I'd like people also to consider looking at the Dark Skies DVD set. Which oh, yeah, can. sure. Yeah, it's absolutely. available at Shout Factory and also on Amazon and all that. And again, it's the Dark Skies TV series, not the movie. Okay, so after... Uh, after I did Dark Skies, I was working on a show called The Crow, uh, where I ran the, the, the Crow show for a little over a year. And we were on, uh, we were near where these Taken offices had just set up when The Crow got canceled. So I told my agent I'd really like to work on Taken, and he called them up, and I went over and I met with these guys that had just started uh, crewing up a writing room, and they, you know, I got hired. And so I worked on the... Uh, the writing room for Taken uh, for quite a while, and we broke the entire series. And uh, it was a Spielberg uh, production, so that did involve, I was a co-executive producer, and there was another co-ex and an executive producer. So the three of us were the lucky guys that got to be part of the Spielberg, um, uh, we, today we would call it a Zoom meeting, uh, but back when this was happening in, I think, 2000, you know, putting, putting people together for a video conference was a really big deal. So the, the three of us were set up in Hollywood and Spielberg was set up in the Hamptons, I think. And, you know, I'm, we're watching sort of like, you know, where we are right now and we watch Spielberg come stepping in and uh, looking at the camera and everything. And then the guy on our end says, I don't even know why I'm telling this story, George, but it's funny. The guy says, Mr. Spielberg has a big problem. And we were like, oh, crap. Are we going to get fired? What's going on with this thing? And the big problem is he didn't like the lighting on us. So I can now say that I've been lit by Steven Spielberg. <laughs> that, was, that was good. Anyway, uh, we talked to him about UFOs. I did not come away from that meeting thinking that he had, you know, knew more about UFOs, say, than I did. Uh, although, I, you know, I think we all knew a lot. Um, so it was interesting because I know people have said he's the insider, but he was as interested as we were going, well, you know, what do you think happened at Roswell? You know, we would have that kind of talk. Now, as for the series, what did happen to the series is um, we were cruising along and then in the middle of that, uh, as things happened, Spielberg, I think, had some kind of movie he had to direct. So the whole project got thrown to the wind and uh, I went off and got another job. Uh, some of the other guys did too. And then it reassembled itself. And what you see is still pretty much the story that we broke, but I was not a part of, of writing the individual scripts for that story. And I will only say this, the re one reason you probably do want to watch Dark Skies is you look at the pilot of Taken, 
The pilot of Taken had me working on it as a writer. It was directed by Toby Hooper, who directed the pilot of Dark Skies. It was produced by Stephen Beers, who produced just the pilot of Dark Skies. And it has a, one of its stars, Eric Close, who was the star of Dark Skies. And when I had met Steven Spielberg, when I, I wrote a video game for him in the mid 90s, or late 90s after Dark Skies, he came in and shook my hand and said, hey, I really like Dark Skies, I'm a big fan. And at the time I thought it was just glad handing, but now that I see you know, the uh, lineage to the whole thing, he probably was telling the truth. Uh, but you're right, it's a, it's a fascinating show that in many ways, um, tried to do the same thing Dark Skies did, which is to take those, those uh, elements that we all think are the, the, the deep core beliefs of ufology and, and, and all of, often seem so disparate from crop circles to animal mutilations to Area 51 to Tic Tacs in the sky and, and try to make sense of like, why are they all happening at the same time? And that's a pretty big uh, bite to take off and chew on for, for a, a mere television writer. But you can see though, uh, w what I'm saying is, in order to bring your game up to write Taken or Dark Skies or Official Denial, you have to do a lot of reading. And so I, I, uh, I think one of the things that I brought to the Taken staff that they were most pleased about is I had this enormous UFO book library and I just brought it all to the office and everybody just started you know, consuming all these books to feed our heads, if you will, so that we could do um, the best po uh, possible job, which may explain why you like it so much. Well, yeah, Dark Skies taken, there's a lot of uh, interbreeding there uh, and, you know, and, and similar quality uh, of uh, material that you, that you put out. Uh, you had to learn a heck of a lot along the way to be able to write the, these things. And, and now you're writing again, you're, you're writing on medium and yeah. during a time when the UFO topic is red hot. Um, yeah. And I'd like to talk to you about the media environment a little bit, and not only that you are an observer of it, but also a contributor to it. Um, what do you think about this moment? What, what do you think about it? Is there a possibility of too much of oversaturation? Well, even if there is, there's nothing we can do about it. So we just have to go along, you know, buy, as Hunter Thompson said, buy the ticket, take the ride. So we're all on the ride together. So, um, is there too much? I don't think so. There's maybe not enough serious, but it's getting better. And, and honestly, um, one of the things uh, that I've given a great deal of thought about is the, is the very concept of disclosure, obviously. Uh, it became the duality of dark skies. One character said the people have a right to know. The other character said the people can't handle the truth. Um, it became a book I co-wrote with Richard Dolan that we may talk about later. later. And so in order to to be a, a, a viable part of that discussion, I started reading all these books and I started buying, you know, I have quite a library and I used to put them in, in the order of uh, the date that they were published so that I could sort of see how things evolved. So I'd read through them about disclosure, for example. I would pull out, you know, something by Kehoe from 53 and flip through it and find the disclosure things. And I'll tell you the one thing that has been interesting about it is you realize people have been predicting disclosure for 70 years just like you know ever since Roswell people have been saying they're going to tell us the truth any day now so there is that and we have a probably a, a, a mutual acquaintance in Steve Bassett who runs the Paradigm Research Group and the joke I always say to Steve is he's been produced predicting that uh, disclosure will happen next year every year since I've known him and eventually he's going to be right and so the answer to your question, I think, is something different is happening right now, uh, something profound. Um, and, and my friend, I must say, you have been a stellar part of this for all of your career. And these little building blocks build the bigger pieces and they lead other people to do research and to talk about it. And we are reaching that critical mass right now. Could you put the genie back in the bottle right now? Not entirely. So I do think we are on a path. I do. Let's talk about the New York Times. I mentioned that you've been writing uh, pieces for Medium, which is a yeah. great outlet. Uh, I don't, you know, it hasn't been around long enough to say whether it's, its treatment of the UFO subject, its willingness to put those articles up is a departure for them. Um, but it does seem like something has changed with that platform as well. Talk about writing for them, what it allows you to do, how much freedom you have, and then we'll get into some of the sure. pieces that you've written. I will tell you right now that uh, just for your uh, viewers, listeners 
who don't quite know what Medium is. It's just a platform. It's like, instead of having your own blog right now, it's a giant ecosystem where writers can write uh, and, and have the, their material circulated. Um, the one thing I will say, and, and so I've enjoyed it because primarily what I've decided to do is, you know, I, I'm at a certain age right now and there's a certain amount of interest going on and I'm trying to uh, fill a vacuum that I haven't seen. What I have, I liked the old fashioned political columnists, you know, who would write an essay uh, a, a week or every few days. I'm trying to do that to be more reflective. I'm trying to bring some, you know, high quality writing to the subject matter. So that's what I'm doing on, on Medium and, and I'm, I'm enjoying it right now. But I will say one thing, uh, just to kind of go a little deeper into what uh, you were saying at the ver in, in your question. Medium is a, is a ecosystem that um, curates material. So if you write a great article and you are literate and grammatical and you don't misspell every other word and you know how to format it, which I know how to do all those things pretty well. So I write high quality articles. Every single non-UFO article I have written has been curated by Medium and spread across their ecosystem. And not one single UFO article that I have written has been curated by Medium. I don't know what it is about their, um, you know, their, you know there, there may be some kind of uh, standard, I don't know, that's unspoken. Maybe the, the, the fact that UFO turns up in a, these articles is an automatic suspension, but they will not circulate them. So any success I bring to these Medium articles, I have to do it on my own through Twitter or Facebook or shows like yours or whatever, because I, I, they're not doing it. So what I take from that is that we are not yet past the bad old days where it's, there's still a little bit of a taint on the subject. And I, I look forward to the day where not only will Medium and other places say, we, instead of burying Mr. Sable's articles, we are going to drive people to them because this is important. But right now that's not the case. But uh, that's, I don't mean to whine, uh, just, it, it is a factual thing about how it works. So I do think it is time for us. There's, there's other ways to express ourselves besides just podcasts and Twitter, right? Um, I think sometimes um, I don't mind a good tweet. I, I certainly like to do that, but sometimes you want to, you want to tell the story in a little more and you want to, you want to build the logical argument and you want to add some historical perspective and some context to it. And I think that's what I'm really trying to do. I am trying to write articles that not only appeal to people like you who know everything under the sun about it, but who enjoy seeing the sort of the, the give and take and interaction with what's uh, contemporary in the news. Um, but I also have been trying to write articles that some of my friends might actually enjoy who have not paid attention to the UFO issue and know very little about it. And I'm trying to bring them in and up to speed at the same time. Uh, one of the recent articles you wrote was about the New York Times. And it was yes. an interesting perspective. Oh, and it was, it was a thought that I had as well when I saw the two reporters reacting to some of the chit chat on yeah. social media about their article. And I was really surprised by, by their, their take on it because, you know, the New York Times, what they've done, and I'm sure you agree over the last couple of years, they've changed the media environment entirely. The, Absolutely. You know, a lot of the building blocks for what happened for that were right here in Las Vegas. Bob Bigelow creates NIDS, which tries to create a scientific uh, organization that investigates UFOs and related phenomena. That, that eventually becomes BASS. The DIA gives a contract to Bass under a program called OSAP. OSAP evolves into something called ATIP. Lou Elizondo leaves uh, the uh, Pentagon, goes to work for Tom DeLong. They, along with Chris Mellon, start working on the New York Times, and the New York Times publishes this amazing story, December of 2017. Not entirely 100% accurate, but pretty close, and it changes everything. Yeah, and the, the, because it makes it access, acceptable for other uh, news organizations to go ahead and cover it. At least if the New York Times is writing about it, we can write about it. And that changes everything because it also gives cover to Congress to ask these questions in a serious way. So I give all the credit in the world to the New York Times for the December 2017 story and all the stories that have come since then. But I was kind of surprised by the take of the writers 
and and you were too. I I kind of went off on the journalist. First of all, I everything you said, yes, sir. I agree with all that. What they've done was heroic and and sensational, and I'm I'm in favor of this and it has open doors. Having said that, we're talking about Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal, two very bright, personable people who I've not met personally, but everyone I know who has met them says this about them. And so I, I take nothing away from them or their work, their hard work or their good work. But I was shocked the day after where they did an interview on a, on a podcast uh, out of the UK and they both reserved, okay, Instead of reserving hostility for a 70-year cover-up that required them to go do this reporting, they spent most of their anger talking about how people on the internet made their reporting more difficult and annoyed them. And I just don't see it that way. I mean, George, you're an investigative reporter. Uh, in my other incarnation, I was too. You need a very thick skin. I mean, you're not... The world is not going to bend to your reality. In fact, if you want that, uh, you know, go do an entertainment show. Um, if you're going to do investigative reporting, you know, people are going to debate it and talk about it and disagree about it. And that's something that goes with uh, the territory. I was just shocked. Uh, and I think maybe they're just more used to asking questions than answering them. And they were frustrated. They were ticked off. I get it. But uh, it, it just seemed misplaced. So I... So that's one of the articles I wrote, and I didn't see too many people going into the depth. Uh, they'll probably never take my phone calls again, which would be a mistake. Uh, but I, I just feel like um, they 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 misplaced their their passionate irritation. It should be with the cover up, not with the people who are, frankly, sitting on pins and needles waiting to hear what they're going to write about. I mean. As a reporter, if I had a bunch of people waiting to read what I wrote, how great would that be? And I'm sure you feel the same way. So, yeah, it was a mistake. I bet they won't make it again. Bright people usually don't make the same mistake twice. So probably they'll be a little more open about that. Instead of wagging their fingers at us, they'll say, thanks a lot for your enthusiasm. You know, as I, I saw that the chatter on Twitter and other platforms where people are speculating about what's going to be in it, and then a couple of people like UFO Joe who have their own sources and they're saying, this is going to be in it, this is going to be big. Um, you know, my take was, look, caution, because it's a heavy lift. It's one thing to say there's a UFO program in the Pentagon. It's another to say there, there's uh, credible evidence that we've got crash retrievals UFO debris, metamaterials, unidentified stuff that's yeah. off world, that's heavy, that's a heavy lift to get past your editors. And in the end, a lot of what they tried to get in there didn't make it. Um, yeah. Now, I hopefully they're going to continue to work on it, but it didn't make it, it didn't get past the editors. So, you know, those expectations, the grandiose expectations by people who are commenting in anticipation of the article were probably pretty close to the truth. Well, and, I, 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 I have to tell you, what, what, if you read what uh, Kane and Blumenthal were irritated about, uh, these people talking ahead of time, I say, what was the number one thing that I took away from all the Twitter enthusiasm? These people were saying a New York Times article was coming out and that the New York Times was, look, was getting ready to drop one. And they said that it would involve crash wreckage. Well, that's true. So how could they be upset about that? That is absolutely 100% factual. So UFO Joe, while, you know, let's not get into everyone's personality. We all are quirky. You have your quirks, I have mine, certainly. And Joe has his. But in, in actual fact, the two primary points about this whole thing that Twitter was buzzing about were actually true. The New York Times was interviewing people about crash wreckage. That happened. And, you know, it's not a secret. I mean, no. these are not new topics. These, these topics, the same witnesses have been around a long time. They have made a number of public statements. I've reported many of those same statements in stories up for a couple of years from the same people, the same yeah. sources. And if you are working on a big story like the New York Times has been, and you are interviewing people about very sensitive topics, um, just as a suggestion, I, I try to work those things out with the sources I interview. Hey, I'm working on this. Can you keep quiet for a while? I want to break this story. Um, I think a lot of the people that they were talking to did not keep quiet. I know, I know four people that were they talked to long before the interview came out, 
And so it dribbled out in bits and pieces. And um, it's not a surprise. They didn't have a secret to begin with. And it's not a surprise that there'd be so much anticipation, which, as you said, is a good thing. You know what's going to happen, though? Um, I, think this, I think we can look to Watergate uh, for, for some inspiration here. What happened with Watergate? Well, Woodward and Bernstein did own it. They, they, they broke the story. They wrote it hard. And they never gave up. But, but once the world realized, oh, this Watergate thing is a real thing, other newspapers started putting reporters on it to investigate it. So I think what you're going to see with the whole UFO topic, um, it, it, may not, it may not reveal itself instantly, but, but certainly over the next few months, you're going to see that other uh, respected news sources are going to be putting more of their uh, talent and attention onto it. And so I don't think the New York Times is going to own this story forever. They, they've got it right now. Uh, you've had it. Um, I, I think what we need to say is, come on in, the water's fine. I mean, let's, let's get this thing done. Exactly right. I mean, it was, a, it was a tremendously important story. I'm so glad that they had the fortitude and the courage to push forward with it. And I'm glad they got it past, what their, past the editors what they were able to do. And hopefully, they're continuing to work on it. But the really lasting impact was the same as the December 2017 uh, story, is that other media picked up on it. And you, we've seen it. There's been dozens of other articles uh, by media all over the world in response to what the New York Times printed. And, you know, Although so that's a good thing. Those articles are the regurgitation articles where it's like, okay, the New York Times broke it. And now I'm going to, now it's safe for me to write about what they wrote about. We're going to see other, other people join in on that, which is going to be, uh, you know, fascinating to watch, and uh, we're all in for quite a ride. There's no question. Now, in addition to just whiny critics, we have, I think, genuine debunkers who attack this, uh, these stories and this subject while wearing ufologist clothing, uh, that they are hostile to the topic, pretending like they're interested in it, and lecturing the rest of us how it really should be done. Oh, there's, uh, there's three or four that we could, we could name right away. And then there's some of the ones that pretend that they're neutral and they're really not. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what's going to really kill me is when disclosure is like very clearly full-throated and on, and then Neil deGrasse Tyson and Seth Shostak and, and uh, Bill Nye get to appear on television going, yeah, I knew about this all along. I, that, that's just going to kill me. Uh, but, you know, that's the way it goes. Um, that, and this is nothing new, by the way. Uh, we're talking about all that, that UFO book library. I mean, let's face it, going back to, uh, you know, uh, I mean, to the beginning, mean, you've had these people doing it from the beginning. You've had Phil Klass doing it. You had Donald Menzel doing it. I would argue you had Carl Sagan doing it. Um, so I, I, I think that the people who pose as scientific uh, experts who who aren't the least bit interested in investigating scientifically a phenomenon of this magnitude are the people that really I, I wish would be shunned in the, in the near future. I fear they won't be, but it, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's small potatoes when we finally get into it. But yeah, I mean, it's frustrating. And, and I do think that there, you know, this historically, uh, people, uh, the, the first the flying saucer groups and then UFO groups and now UAP groups have all had people sort of observing them and attempting to distort them and, and, and all that over the years. And when disclosure truly gets on, this probably won't be happening for a while, but there will be books written about some of these people and how they actually were paid shills to do the opposite of what they said they were doing. Um, maybe I'll write one of them. But Yeah, there you go. I, you know, I think about Seth Shostak of yeah. SETI. Yeah. Why in the world he gets interviewed about UFOs, I don't know. But every time there's some new development, media people go to him. He doesn't know crap about UFOs, and he becomes, he's held up as the authority. Um, it, it's amazing to me that uh, somebody who has never really studied cases, who doesn't know the literature, um, he gets uh, interviewed as being the authority for lack of evidence. He wrote an article the other day, or was quoted in an article, where he's complaining about the dearth of evidence uh, in the UFO field. That takes a lot of balls to say that from somebody from SETI 
millions of dollars, a global effort to collect information about radio signals from space, not one, not one single one over all these years, and yet that program is somehow scientific and respectable and UFO studies are not. It, I, I, this makes me want to tear what little hair I've got out uh, because let's face it, this is, this is insane. Uh, let's, let's all spend millions, I mean, oh, fine, SETI's fine, but, but to say that's the only acceptable way to look for uh, other intelligent life, my God, it looks like it's here. Why not investigate that with the same verve and, and passion? I, it, it makes no sense. And because it makes so little sense, you do have to ask yourself, what is the angle with some of these people? Now, I will say, um, over time, I, I read a book that Philip Class wrote a few years back. And I will say he was at least informed enough on the topic that he was debunking that he did have some fa facts in it. I mean, um, I, you know, I'm producing, a, hopefully, a television series about the Betty and Barney Hill case, and he had written about it. And I thought he did a fair summation of explaining what they were all about before he then debunked it. And uh, the late uh, Stanton Friedman, who was a friend of mine, used to debate uh, class all the time. And they, th those debates were at least high class compared to what I see passing for uh, a, a knock on Twitter these days. It's really sad. And the only thing you can really do is keep your head down and just ignore that and just keep moving on and not not try to get overly engaged with it because they are not where the science is going they are a distraction and we need to get on with the work ahead um, you know before we leave the new york times and and yeah. the impact of their reporting there you know the new york times has covered ufos here and there over the years yeah. and at one point 19 early 60s they would was fairly positive in its coverage genuinely curious and then they just pretty much ignored it for a long time. Uh, there's a book called, you probably read this, uh, The Missing Times by Terry Hansen that sort of a analyzes how major media have treated the UFO topic over the years. And the Times has been pretty dismal. So for Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal and, and Helene Cooper to get this on absolutely. is absolutely amazing because the Times have been pretty much hostile and, and uh, to the UFO subject. And, and has ignored it. Uh, you know, I think back to the 1975 Northern Tier overflight cases. That's a gigantic story. Nuclear missile bases are, are visited one after another by UFOs and the launch control systems are interfered with. That's gigantic. That's national security written all over it. And they just kind of brush it off. Oh, it's, it's the worst thing. I remember when Dolan and I were writing after Disclosure, there was uh, the, the, uh, at the National Press Club, they got uh, a Robert Salas and a bunch of other people who had, were part of that emerging story about nuclear missiles being engaged by UFOs. And these guys, you know, were important people who had spent their lives dedicated to the security of the United States military and frankly were were trusted with nuclear weapons, right? The Washington Post, for example, back then, sent a reporter to cover their news conference who went, who was a lifestyle reporter, not a national security reporter. And he began his story talking about the kinds of cookies they served there. So this is how far we've traveled. So before we totally uh, leave New York Times, I do want to, again, doff my hat to the work uh, that they've been doing. It's, it's terrific. And I think what's happened is, you know, they, they got that first, they, they got traction with that first article and they didn't get a lot of pushback about being not serious. And so the editing staff has sort of said, all right, let's go for a little bit more. Let's see what, you know, how far we can take this. Uh, if I had any criticism of the actual article that just came out about crash wreckage, it was that it looked like it had been, uh, edited and written by a committee a little bit. It, it looked like it, the, some of the sharp edges have been sanded off, but, but what would you expect? I mean, people who have worked with editors know that's their job to really, you know, Woodward and Bernstein didn't get a pass on everything that they said. They had to go prove a lot of it. So I look for more from uh, the, the Times, and frankly, I look for a couple other big papers or institutions to get involved with it, but I hope they put their top reporters on it because it really, it, it shouldn't be lifestyle reporters. It needs to be their, their, their very best, like you. Well, I know that there was one uh, part of it that really struck me, and I, we wrote a story about it for Mystery Wire. It was about Harry Reid. Now, I, you know, I've had a relationship with Harry Reid 
a secret conversation about UFOs for 30 years. And his interest goes way, way back. He just didn't want to broadcast it, you know, and his involvement in the creation of what became ATIP, OSAP, the program, um, he, he's right there in supporting it. But uh, I've interviewed him so many times on this and have conversed with him about it on and off the record that when I saw the quote from him as saying that he thinks there is material from other worlds, um, I was flabbergasted because I've asked him that multiple times directly. And although he suspects that there might be uh, something like that, he had no direct knowledge. So he's pretty steamed. He's pretty ticked off about how his remarks were characterized. And I don't think he's going to be giving any more in UFO interviews for a while, uh, not to the New York Times, um, because he's still upset about it. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I was thrilled to read the quote and upset to see him pull it back, but I understand. I mean, uh, given the givens, I, I guess that's the way it is, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry if he withdraws too much because the truth of the matter is he's an important voice in it. And frankly, uh, whether he said, I, I, I'll take your word for it, he didn't say that quote, I'll take his word for it rather, um, but it's right. And he's going to be, he's going to go down in history as a very, very important player uh, in this thing. And someone who is willing to stick his neck out early on. And, uh, and, and by the way, there are a collection of people like that. Him in politics, you certainly in journalism. I know I can only imagine that when you first started uh, some of the stories you were reporting that you had to, you know, you, you got some pushback from the people that you were working for and writing your checks. So I, I think that there are a collection of people who have come forward over time whose stories only deepen. Lazar might be a great example of that as well. For years, the question has been, well, was he telling the truth or wasn't he telling the truth? I always went with my friend George. If you said he was telling the truth, I sort of believed that. And then I, as I got to know more about it, I said, well, he's definitely telling uh, the truth, but a lot of people went back and forth on it. Now, what's interesting about where we are with the New York Times reporting and so forth is that you can start to look at these other cases in that context and you give them more credibility. Um, and, and by the way, if I can just add one other little bit to this New York Times thing that I think is just a little bit of interest is um, we were talking about these medium articles. I had written one called, Yes, There Is UFO Crash Wreckage. And basically, it was all about how I believe that Roswell is an authentic and real event. And I teed it off the fact that everyone was talking about how the New York Times was going to be writing about crash wreckage. That article uh, stating that Roswell was a true event was uh, posted by um, uh, Chris Mellon of, of uh, TTSA on his own personal site and left there without comment, but left there at the top of his site for a month. I, I don't know exactly why people, why he would do that if he didn't find some merit in the argument. And the argument is completely about Roswell. So there may be another shoe dropping here. That would be the big granddaddy of it all. And boy, that would change the debate and the discussion because uh, one of the things we did in Dark Skies is we just said, well, let's just assume Roswell is real. What would the world look like when John Kennedy took the oath of office? So I think we might be in that position again to start looking at, I don't know how you feel about Roswell. What do you think about the Roswell story? Well, I think it's uh, something, it wasn't crash test dummies and, uh, and, um, concentration camp victims and a, a Russian craft. I, I don't think so. I think, I think the story that they printed on the first day in the Roswell newspaper is probably closer to the truth. The problem is it's now so muddled uh, because of false witnesses who've come forward, false claims that have been um, made, disinformation that's probably been seeded by the government, flat out denials, um, murky um, versions of the story that have been created by the Air Force over the years. Unless you have a piece of the stuff and can present it to the public, it's going to be hard to figure that out. I, I'd just like to add one more thing about Harry Reid. You know, he and I had talked about crash retrievals and materials, and he had s tried to create a special access program in 2009, taking what was OSAP and ATIP into something that would have access, presumably have access to other SAPs, where they would have files, information, evidence. And he said materials. And materials doesn't necessarily mean crash retrievals, pieces of a saucer, but he was open to that possibility. He remains open to the possibility. Just the point was that he's never seen direct evidence of it himself. He wanted to find out. He'd heard the stories that we've heard, but he didn't know for sure. So that's 
really what his position has always been. That's why I was surprised by the quote in the New York Times. I don't yeah. know how they got the quote, uh, whether uh, he was saying something and answering a question different from what he thought he was being asked, but somehow there was confusion in there. The net effect of the New York Times story, though, has been tremendous. It's been great encouraging other journalists to pursue this. And you have written a couple of articles sort of in the same theme. The, the recent pieces, the summer of the saucers is one. And then you wrote something about Joe Biden's UFO oh. briefing memo. Yeah. You know, with all Donald Trump making uh, allusions to UFOs a couple of times, always in sort of a joking way, him being interviewed by his son, um, you know, uh, yeah, I might have to reopen Roswell. I, I don't know exactly what he meant. I don't know if he paid attention to the briefing that I believe he has had, perhaps two of them. Um, but I was encouraged by him even acknowledging the, the topic at all. And I figured it would happen. It's been on Fox News for so long, you know, since the New York Times story. You don't see Fox and the New York Times agreeing on much, but Tucker Carlson doing one UFO program a month, you'd figure it's going to register with Trump at some point. So um, I'm encouraged. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'm encouraged that he has at least a passing interest in it. Um, I'm not encouraged by the sort of the joking tone of it. But if there were to be a presidential briefing for, say, a new president, you have an idea about what it would say. What would it yeah. say? Well, um, I, it's it's, I, it's true. I think I do think that we have reached the place where we, the first time in our nation's history where we may have UFOs discussed during a presidential campaign in a serious way and possibly in the debates. And that's partly because Trump is a loose cannon enough about speaking whatever's on his mind that he may just drop it into the middle of something. But I, I th and I think that that is a possibility. But clearly, uh, the the world we live in is increasing talking about UFOs. Marco Rubio is talking about it, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, New York Times, Harry Reid. There's just a lot of stuff bubbling up. So I wrote, uh, it wasn't really tongue in cheek. It was actually meant to be semi-serious. It's, it's a, uh, a briefing memo for Joe Biden about UFOs that uh, I know that he, the premise was, I know you're all uh, into picking your VP nominee, but as soon as you get done with that, you should turn your attention to this UAP uh, situation because you may very well be asked about it. It may come in a town, a virtual town hall. It could come in a one-on-one -on -one interview as it has with Trump, or it could even be that the president himself will just dump it into the middle of the campaign. Now, why would Trump do that, say, in a debate? Because uh, it does sound outrageous, but I could see him doing it because if he thinks he's actually about to lose the election, the most disruptive thing that he could possibly do would be to dump UFOs smack dab into the middle of it. And he would also get some more satisfaction about it. He hates the Clintons with a passion and uh, he knows that they wanted to do it. So he might enjoy doing it and not letting them do it. Uh, I, I have to say on a personal level, I'm not wildly excited about Donald Trump being the disclosure president, but I don't control history or, or news. So it could happen. And I think Biden, um, your question was, what should Biden say? Or what did I say that Biden should say? I think what he needs to do is being calm and straightforward about it. If he's asked about it, uh, he needs uh, to actually take a page out of Marco Rubio's uh, playbook there. He needs to acknowledge that um, there, are, there are discussions about this, that these things have been seen. He's seen the videos and he knows these pilots are good Americans. He, he's uh, read up on the issue and and he will certainly uh, be a transparent president he'll look into it as best he can and while some of it may be classified uh, he does understand that need to know has been used for too many years to uh, keep people from knowing anything and he should probably look at the camera and say uh, i don't think there's anyone who needs to know more than the american people and i'll do that so that's what i would suggest to him there's so much uh, in the summer of the saucers, there's so much uh, that's encouraging on this subject matter. Um, you know, we now know, uh, you know, we, we have these conflicting statements from the Pentagon over the last two and a half years as if they're trying to figure out which way to go. You know, the initial statements about ATIP were, hey, that program ended in 2012. It never found anything of any interest, you know, so that's why we ended it. Well, it didn't end. Uh, it doesn't, wasn't really about UFOs. Well, yes, it was about UFOs. Lou Elizondo didn't work for it. Yes, he did work for it. 
we didn't really release those videos. Yeah, you did release those videos and now you've released them twice. Um, so, you know, it's hard to put much confidence in anything that the Pentagon says, except for some of these announcements they've acknowledged to Congress behind closed doors and in public. Yeah, we've got a study. It's based in the Office of Naval Intelligence, which I personally think is a pretty good spot for it. They have a budget, they have personnel, they have more resources than ATEP ever had, uh, at least the, the Elizondo part of ATEP, not OSAP. And that is an encouraging thing. And then, then the US Navy telling its pilots, we're gonna make it easier for you to talk about this. It is astonishing to me that these things are happening in our lifetime. I never thought I'd see them. I, I, I didn't either. And, and so the playing field has changed, uh, certainly. I mean, you know, we're, we're both, I think, roughly the same age and we can look back over uh, the, the lifetimes we've lived and how we might have felt uh, how close, you know, there's the doomsday clock for uh, nuclear war. There, what about the disclosure clock? How close were we? Well, while the doomsday clock for nuclear war was always like two minutes till midnight, we've always been, at, you know, like, well, it's noon, right? Because it's just, it's been too tight. But now I think we are coming upon a time where we can't stop. This is going to go forward. Um, we're going to have congressional hearings on this. <clears throat> sometime soon. And by soon, I'm going to put it over a horizon the next couple of years uh, of some kind. And uh, they could, and, you know, you can't be a little bit pregnant. You can't just a little bit uh, acknowledge that UFOs are real without asking for some more uh, information. And in fact, I think what is really uh, buried in this thing that is about to explode is this. Um, if you listen to what Marco Rubio said and, and, and what a lot of people have been saying is the, the idea, even the TTSA guys, they try to frame it as, well, this is a national security issue. I mean, you know, we need to know if, uh, if, if these things aren't ours. I mean, if they're ours, we need to know that. But if they're not ours, we need to know if we've been leapfrogged by China or Russia, you know, well, Let's face it, we all pretty much know they're not ours, and we pretty much know they're not Chinese or Russian. And why do we know that? We know that the same five observ observables about what UFOs are capable of doing have been demonstrated since the late 40s, into the 50s, into the 60s, where I'm pretty damn sure that we did not have technology like that, and I think most people would acknowledge that. So let's do the math on this. By process of elimination, if it ain't us, and it's not China, and it's not Russia, who are the other suspects here? I would only argue, they don't have to be extraterrestrial, but they have to be very unusual. And once you open your brain up to, they're not being made by us, then you have opened up a whole wide discussion. And I think that, you know, something I've been thinking for a couple of years now is the closest analog to what the 2020s are going to look at like is the 1960s, only with aliens. We're going to have a lot of social disruption. Uh, we're going to have pandemics and we're going to have climate change and, and, uh, and Black Lives Matter social justice calls and aliens. And it's going to be a rocking, unusual and historical ride. And it's just getting started. Yeah, I'm, I'm equally encouraged. I'm encouraged by, I'm willing to give the UAP task force the benefit of the doubt if, if it benefits them to approach this as saying, we need to find out where these are from. We don't know. Um, so we're going to go under the premise that it might be Russian and Chinese and hope that it's not. And then once we cross that threshold, you know, and we, we investigate under that premise, then we'll tackle the question of who it might be. But I don't think anybody really knows. I, I think we do have crash materials. I think it's something that, that is beyond our capability to produce. I think there are bits and pieces and maybe even more than that. Um, but it doesn't mean, even if we have bodies, that we know where they're from. Um, so You bring up bodies though, George. I, here's a question I have. All right, if we had an entire crash saucer or even parts of a saucer, Okay, I could understand in a very dangerous world how that might have to be classified, at least initially, as national security, and maybe even now. But if you have bodies, why is that classified as national security? The bodies themselves are not going to help us make flying saucers that can defeat our rivals. So that really, the national security thing doesn't really go with bodies as much. So there's just a lot of different ways that this is 
is going to be peeled apart. Part of it is journalistic. Are there, I, I guess the thing that we're probably all seeing right now is that the moving parts are moving wider and faster than they used to. And they include not just uh, activists, they include journalists, they include military people. And while I wouldn't just, you know, call, uh, you know, you could hardly call Harry Reid a whistleblower and you could hardly call uh, uh Lou Elizondo, a whistleblower, but there's something more than just an, a, you know, a, a, a side observer. They're, they're involved and they're willing to tell us that this is a, something useful that we should be looking into. And I think people are listening. I, my conversations that I have uh, at, well, it used to be, I used to use the metaphor of dinner parties, uh, which we can't have anymore. <laughs> You know, it used to be that I would say, when I would start talking about uh, UFOs in a social gathering at a barbecue or a dinner party, I was treated like the drunk uncle at the wedding. You know, oh, there goes Bryce. He's talking about that stuff again. Oh, boy. And instead now, I find more and more of my friends and family who, who come to me as a source. They go, you know, I saw that little bit on CNN the other day. Um, there's more to that. What do you know? People are hungry to know. And people that are hungry to know demand answers. So going to get interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think because of the work that TTSA has done and getting the New York Times interested and then subsequent media interest and then Congress being interested, uh, that it, it is going to be hard to put the genie back in the bottle. You look at the big picture, statements from the Pentagon and the, the UAP task force and Congress being interested and putting money into it and asking for disclosure, there's so many moving parts and so much going on on different fronts, it sort of looks like it's all the same thing, that maybe somebody is orchestrating it. I don't think that that is the case. I think that there are multiple independent things that are happening, and they are mutually supportive, but it is not necessarily coordinated. It might not be. Um, although, if you think about it, my, my, so, my uh, collision with the Office of Na Naval Intelligence, if that's what it was, occurred in '96. Um, and that felt coordinated. It felt like these guys said, we have been given an assignment. And, and maybe, maybe we kind of uh, tweaked them a little bit because the Dark Skies pilot said that the people who were running the cover-up were from the Navy, not the Air Force. And uh, it was guys that showed up who said they were from the Navy. So, you know, the Navy has cer certainly taken front and center these days. But um, there's just a, a lot of that going on. In fact, it's, it's very funny. There's so much education that's going to have to be done for the public. I may have to write an article about this because when you, I just wrote this down. When you were started to talking, there's ATIP, OSAP, uh, BASS, uh, TTSA, NIDS, UAP, Task Force, SSCI. There's so many acronyms out there. How does anybody, you know, you and I do this as a passion. You do it for a living. I, I just don't know. The average person needs to have a way to look at this and it's going to take a while. So we're, you know, I think the pace is good. Pace is well, good. I, that's, I'm greatly encouraged by the fact that, as you mentioned, a much broader audience is now interested in the subject. It's not just us UFO nuts who are, who are interested in it and following it. It's a much broader audience and they need, it's a learning curve. It takes yes. a long time to figure this stuff out. Yeah. And, and in fact, um, we've, I think you touched on it. For years, the UFO, let's, you know, I know people don't want to be called activists, but that's what I feel I am and I feel other people are. Uh, activists have been talking to themselves. So when people tweet, they talk to themselves about these issues, these insider issues. I think what's going to happen is that wall is going to break down a little bit and that it, you'll, you'll start reaching out to the larger audience, which is the rest of the world, everybody else. And we will stop writing books for ourselves and we'll start writing for the world at large and we'll start to make these news reports. You know, let's face it, uh, the New York Times news report is not aimed at UFO activists, even though UFO activists are very excited by it. But why were they excited about it? They were excited about it because it's breaking into the mainstream. And, you know, I, I don't want to get overly political here, but I don't think there's anything wrong with the mainstream media. They can make mistakes, of course, but they can also do great things and, you know, vice versa for other media. I, I think it's a, it's a big ocean that we're swimming in and there's room for everybody. Um, 
we're going to wrap this up. I want to encourage people to, we're going to post links to some of your articles on Medium because right. it's, a, it's a great way and introduction to the topic for those who are not steeped in this stuff every day. I hope people will check out Dark Skies, um, the series. Is DVD, is it in other formats as well? Uh, no. In fact, uh, one of the reasons it's not streaming is there's always been a problem with music rights that have held it up, or at least I was told have held it up. We got them cleared for the DVD. The DVD set is fantastic. There's two documentaries on it about the series, the making of it, and there's uh, lots of Easter eggs, and it's beautiful. So I'm really proud of it. So that's a good way to view it, for sure. Uh, Taken is terrific if people have not seen it, if they've seen it before. I, I watched it again, the whole thing through. My wife and I binged it. It's, a, it's terrific. And then uh, AD, After Disclosure, the book you wrote with uh, Richard Dolan. It's terrific. Well, you know, uh, just a parting thought on that. We have now hit basically the 10-year anniversary of AD. So I reread my own book uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it read like, I was like, wow, whoever wrote this, they, you know, it didn't feel like me. You know, you probably have had this. Sometimes you look at a, 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 you know, a piece that you've reported and, and it's been a few years and you go, I don't even remember writing that. I felt that about it, but I looked at it and said, you know, Dolan and I didn't get it 100% right on every small thing because we, we weren't trying to predict the future. We were trying to describe the ecosystem of the future. And I think that we did a pretty good job. And, and I think that we are rapidly entering. Um, well, here's, how, uh, here's a parting thought. We have been living for years in the BC world, which is before confirmation. The AD world, after disclosure, is where we're going. And right now, we are sliding quickly into AD. And that's an exciting time to be alive on this planet. Final point. This week is kind of a big week, week for Beatles fans. Flaming Pie, the reissue, yeah. the collector's edition, expanded. All right, it's one of my top three McCartney albums. And, and it, was, it sounds so much like the Beatles because he had just, when he put that album out, they had just yeah. finished that massive uh, project with the, where he worked with Ringo and George Harrison. And uh, so that has come out this week. It's an exciting time for Beatles fans. And my collector's edition is on the way. But... Um, You've written about the Beatles as well. We share an interest in that and, and an alternate history. So tell, tell the folks who might be music fans about that book. I wrote, uh, uh, a, yeah, I do like what ifs. It used to be UFO is a what if, but now it's a it, what is. Uh, but I, I, I always was frustrated by the fact that the Beatles at the peak of their powers in 1970 just couldn't keep it together. And I thought, well, what if they did? What would have happened? And so I tried to write a very authentic, practical, pragmatic book about how the Beatles might have stayed together and what, for example, the next five years from 70 to 75 would have looked like. I wrote a book called Once There Was a Way, What If the Beatles Stayed Together? And uh, it won the Sidewise Award for Alternate History, which is a very high honor in that piece of the world. And, and I'm very proud of it. It, uh, it shows, you know, just because you and I know a lot about UFOs doesn't mean that we're all UFOs all the time. We also have to be humans. We also have to enjoy all the other things that make us human. And, and frankly, for me, and I, I know for you, Beatles and their music has been one of those great joys in our lives. And it, it, and, and in fact, it was so great to give them another, another go at it. So thank you for bringing it up. It's, it's one of my favorite projects. Yeah, it's awesome. It is a good way to end, too, to tell the UFO researchers, the diehards who might be watching our conversation, there is life beyond UFOs. You know, you got to stop and smell the roses and get away from this stuff once in a while because it will drive you crazy. And by the way, as you're right, I just finished uh, listening to Flaming Pie yesterday. And it was fantastic to see all the outtakes and everything. It was just, they, you know, the Beatles are a gift that keeps on giving. And thank God we have that in our world because it's a, it's a tough world right now. And it's nice to have nice things happening. Ray Sable, well, thanks. Great talking to you. And we'll you. do this again. We will. Thanks so much. Mysterywire.com, home of the unusual and unknown. From Area 51 to the paranormal, it's your source to the most vetted UFO stories and special investigations in the world. Take a journey into the universe of mysterywire.com.